eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Why do healthy, intelligent young women suddenly begin a process which slowly, steadily may lead them to starve themselves to death? Why do young, high achievers exhibiting traits our society values, discipline, self-reliance, hard work, one day turn those traits against themselves towards a path that can lead to emaciated self-destruction? Today, health professionals are confronted with increasing numbers of young women who exhibit various manifestations of self-starvation. Current estimates place their number in the millions. They are all around us. The consensus is that the incidence is reaching epidemic proportions. The disorder anorexia nervosa has been around a long, long time. In 1689, the English physician Richard Morton described the case of an 18-year-old girl. She fell into a total suppression of her monthly courses from a multitude of cares and passions of the mind, from which time her appetite began to abate. I do not remember that I did ever in all my practice see one that was conversant with the living so much wasted with the greatest degree of consumption, like a skeleton only clad with skin. Morton's clinical description of the disorder we know as anorexia nervosa is nearly 300 years old, but it accurately describes the condition that is now becoming epidemic. From early descriptions to the present, our understanding of anorexia nervosa has undergone a number of radical changes. There was a period of several decades when the disorder was completely misdiagnosed as Simmons disease, a rare form of pituitary failure. Unfortunately, the label Simmons disease was applied in the early 20th century to a generation of patients with extreme weight loss, whatever the underlying causes. Since then, the disorder has been described in a variety of ways and attributed to a variety of etiological factors. The treatment of anorexia nervosa during the 1940s and 1950s has been described as its psychoanalytic era. Then it was widely held that the symptoms were caused by underlying psychic conflicts. We see then a syndrome, the main symptoms of which represent an elaboration and acting out in the somatic sphere of a specific type of fantasy the wish to be impregnated through the mouth, which results at times in compulsive eating and at other times in guilt and consequent rejection of food. The continuing search for specific etiological factors has spawned numerous psychological theories. There are still theorists who emphasize the psychic conflicts at the core of the disturbance. In recent years, there has been extensive inquiry into the family psychopathology often associated with the disorder. This has resulted in development of family therapy techniques being incorporated into many programs of treatment. We believe that anorexia nervosa may best be approached with a therapeutic focus on the context of the patient's family. Direct involvement of the family early in the course of the acute cachectic phase may promote a rapid significant weight gain, facilitating return of the patient to the family and peer group in a comparatively short period of time. The search continues for a physiological origin of the disorder. This has resulted in an intense interest in the roles of hormonal and neuroendocrine mechanisms in development of anorexia. Particular emphasis has been placed on the hypothalamic-pituitary relationship. 
The cause of hypothalamic dysfunction in patients with anorexia nervosa remains unresolved. The hypothalamic dysfunction may be secondary to starvation or psychiatric illness. It is possible, however, that patients with anorexia nervosa have primary hypothalamic disease of unknown etiology. Behavioral psychologists have attributed development of the disorder to consequences of learned behavior. Various behavioral treatment programs have been set up which concentrate on rearranging contingencies of reinforcement concerning eating and weight loss behavior. The chronic refusal to eat, sometimes referred to as chronic anorexia, can be effectively controlled through techniques developed in the behavioral laboratory. The syndrome of chronic anorexia is regarded largely as the acquired, learned behavior of rejecting food. When food rejection is not followed by social reinforcement, it disappears in a relatively short period of time, and normal eating is reinstated. Some of these programs place little, if any, emphasis on underlying psychological disturbances. Instead, they concentrate on weight restoration through reinforcement techniques. The physiological and psychological origins of the disorder continue to be explored. However, no inquiry into the origins of anorexia nervosa is complete without factoring in the relentless cultural and social drive towards thinness, which has marked our society for the past quarter century. sixties, the fashion industry has placed increasing emphasis on creating an emaciated look. The current interest in fitness and exercise programs may also be a contributing factor to increased incidence of anorexia nervosa. Beauty has always been determined culturally. The relationship of body shape and weight in terms of a culturally defined ideal has varied greatly in Western civilization. The 17th century paintings of Rubens illustrate a much fuller figured concept of beauty than is accepted in Western culture today. A radical change in our concept of beauty occurred in the early part of the 20th century when the hourglass buxom curvature of the Victorians was replaced by the flapper. Since then, the emphasis on thinness in Western culture has continued to increase. An analysis of centerfold models in Playboy magazine reveals a marked trend over the past 25 years. Current centerfolds are considerably taller and slimmer and represent a striking departure from the norms of previous decades. Whatever the underlying values and attitudes that cause this trend, the results are unmistakable. An obsessive cultural drive exists towards thinness, which supports the increasing incidence of anorexia nervosa. In spite of intense interest in the disorder among scientific researchers and medical practitioners, there is still little agreement regarding the etiology of the disorder or the proper methods of treatment. There is general acceptance that anorexia nervosa occurs most frequently in adolescent and young adult women. Estimates run as high as one in every 200 girls between the age of 12 and 18. Anorexia nervosa is a spectrum disorder with varying clinical symptomatology occurring along a continuum. Whatever form the disorder takes along this continuum, there may also be varying degrees of severity at any point. At one end of the continuum is the anorexic restrictor. Morton's classic 17th century description denotes this type. Marked by drastic weight loss, cachectic appearance, disturbed body image, and a marked fear of gaining weight, the anorexic restrictor is a self-induced starver who tends to be obsessional and perfectionist in personality. The onset of symptoms of this subset of anorexia nervosa usually occurs between the ages of 12 and 20. At the other end of the continuum is the anorexic bulimic, of which the primary symptom is episodes of binge eating in which thousands of calories may be consumed, followed by some method of purging, including self-induced vomiting, laxative abuse and use of diuretics. Members of this subset are usually between the ages of 18 and 30 and tend to stay within their normal weight range. 
Some, however, engage in alternating episodes of binge purge eating and extreme dieting. Numerous studies on college campuses in the United States reveal a shocking incidence of binge purge eating. The studies reveal that between 15 and 20 percent of college-age women in the United States engage in some form of this behavior. Along the continuum, there is a considerable degree of overlap. It is estimated that 50 percent of anorexic restrictors engage in some binge purge eating and laxative abuse. Our understanding of the disorder is further complicated by the fact that around half of adult women in the bulimic category were at one time during their adolescence diagnosed as anorexic restrictors. This suggests that in addition to the dimensions of varying symptomatology and degree of severity of the disorder, that there may be some progression of the disorder across time. A teenage anorexic, for example, may become an anorexic bulimic during her adult years. Increasing understanding of the subsets along the continuum of anorexia nervosa and the great variation in severity have made the search for specific etiological factors even more complex. Although there are still proponents of a single determinant, the most plausible explanation currently being advanced is to view the disorder as having multiple interacting causes, including biological causes, psychological causes, and social causes. Through the use of this multi-determined or biopsychosocial approach, medical scientists are gaining a greater understanding of the causes and proper treatment methods for this continuum of disorders. This is the way these factors may interact, and as yet unexplained biological predisposition may lead to vulnerability. The vulnerability could be exacerbated by endocrine changes at the onset of puberty. A psychological predisposition may be the result of early childhood experience, or perhaps a result of typical family stresses that occur during adolescence. Compounding this is the social and cultural environment. This societal push towards thinness manifests itself first and most vigorously during adolescence. One or more of these factors may create the desire to diet, resulting in weight loss, the weight loss may initially be reinforced by family and peers. Eventually, however, additional weight loss may lead to malnutrition. Once an advanced state of malnutrition is reached, mental changes occur, and the clinical diagnosis of anorexia nervosa becomes manifest. An insidious feature of this disorder is that once an advanced state is reached, the process may become self-perpetuating. A vicious cycle is created in which mental changes foster further dieting, coupled with strong denial of any illness. It is important to remember, however, that no two cases are alike. Patients with anorexia are not a homogeneous group, and biopsychosocial factors rarely mix in an entirely balanced way. From case to case, one of the factors may be much more significant than the others in initiating and sustaining the disorder. A severe family pathology may result in dieting as a means of controlling the family. As dieting and weight loss increase, family dysfunction increases. The social drive for thinness may be less important, limited to initial positive reinforcement for weight loss. As the starvation process progresses, Disturbance and hypothalamic function occurs, further aggravating the process. A similar clinical picture may be initiated by some genetic or physiological predisposition, aggravated or activated by the onset of puberty. Once the weight loss begins, the family, which otherwise was psychologically healthy, becomes stressed. The weight loss may create a family dysfunction. Social or cultural forces may exert little influence on maintaining the dieting. The onset of dieting may occur due to cultural or social forces. Dedicated students of ballet are particularly vulnerable. The physiological changes occurring at puberty may be disturbing and lead to an obsession with thinness. Again, as a result of weight loss, family dysfunction may occur and subsequent biological changes may occur as a result of weight loss. 
In each of the previous three examples, the resulting clinical picture of anorexia nervosa is identical. However, the complexity of symptomatology and the degree of severity along the continuum make it extremely difficult to identify and isolate specific causes. The enigma therefore remains. Nevertheless, the biopsychosocial model does offer health professionals insight into the way these factors interact and a valid approach for developing appropriate treatment plans on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Anorexia nervosa is at once a life-threatening illness, a psychological disorder of individuals, and a manifestation of interpersonal problems within families. Treating these patients, therefore, poses a special challenge to those staff entrusted with their care. The interrelationship between physical and psychological symptoms, the refusal of some patients to acknowledge a disorder, and the tendency of some patients to impede their own treatment create a need for a strong combination of clinical and interpersonal skills for effective nursing management. Nursing interventions to deal with patients with anorexia nervosa are aimed at the goal of weight restoration and adequate nutrition. Whatever the etiology of the disorder or the program of treatment in use, there is a strong consensus on the initial goal of treatment. Interrupt the starvation process to begin restoring the patient to adequate body weight and to ensure good health. If the weight loss cannot be reversed, the patient's life functioning processes will not return to normal and she will not be able to respond to the psychotherapy. She may even die. 
The clinical picture of anorexia nervosa consists of a complex of symptoms relating to the effects of self-induced starvation. Meeting the patient with anorexia initially can be quite startling. A skeletal young woman complaining of being fat. Weight loss may exceed 25% and up to 40% of the patient's original body weight. Because of the severe self-imposed restrictions on the diet by the patient, all the body systems have been deprived of their essential nutrients. The patient will also be dehydrated due to decreased fluid intake. Cachectic in appearance, patients display yellowish complexion and cyanotic hands and feet. The patient's skin and hair are likely to be dry and lanugo hair may be present. Patient's vital signs tend to be lower than normal. The patient usually has bradycardia and hypotension. Cardiac rates below 50 per minute and systolic blood pressure below 80 millimeters of mercury are not uncommon. Body temperature is likely to be below normal as well. Although the reasons are not fully understood, emaciation results in changes in the hypothalamic pituitary function Disruption of hormone secretion results in atrophy of the breasts and reduction of axillary and pubic hair. Low levels of estrogen may cause bone maturation to cease. Disruption of the normal hormone secretions can lead to amenorrhea. Amenorrhea may be what actually causes the patient to seek treatment. Some patients report amenorrhea before the actual onset of weight loss. Loss of body fat, and breakdown of muscle tissue strips the bones of their protective covering. Due to resulting pressure on the nerves, patients may complain of pain when sitting or lying down. Cardiac muscle deteriorates as well. During the weight restoration process, it is extremely critical to renourish the patient gradually to prevent cardiac overload. Lack of nutrition to the brain contributes to cognitive changes such as decreased ability to concentrate, Disturbance of body image and a morbid fear of gaining weight are characteristic of the disorder. Although these distortions in thinking are not necessarily a direct result of lack of nutrition to the brain, these distortions are further aggravated by the emaciation process. In addition, deprivation of nutrients results in increased preoccupation with food. Further complications occur with patients who self-induce vomiting or abuse laxatives and diuretics. As a result of repeated vomiting, hydrochloric acid from the stomach can destroy teeth, gums, and the esophageal lining. Loss of fluid and electrolytes, especially potassium, can lead to serious complications such as cardiac arrhythmias, muscle weakness, tetany, and renal complications. Upon institution of treatment, all patients will undergo a thorough physical examination to rule out any organic basis for the emaciation. Effective nursing management begins with obtaining a comprehensive patient history. The history should include weight history, such as high, low, and ideal weights, menstrual history, eating behaviors, such as age and onset of dieting behavior, purging behavior, such as self-induced vomiting, laxative, diuretic, and enema abuse, depressive symptomatology, such as sleep disturbances and crying spells. Physical behavior, such as exercise habits and sports activities. Academic performance, such as grades and hours spent studying. And social behavior, especially increasing isolation from friends. Often, it's necessary to get historical data from family and friends who may have observed patient behavior prior to hospitalization. Much of the necessary data, however, may be unavailable, since so much behavior occurs in secret. Specific inquiries into family history are important as well. Family depressive disorders, family weight loss history, attitude towards adolescent dieting behavior and weight loss, and marital stress all become potentially significant factors in developing the treatment process. Inquiry into previous treatment should be made. Assessment of family and patient attitudes towards previous treatment provide information on contingencies for family cooperation and help to predict problems in current treatment. Nursing intervention includes specific measures to refeed the patient and monitor and reduce the effects of starvation. Refeeding is necessary to accomplish weight gain, eliminate the toxic effects of malnutrition, 
and prepare the patient for psychotherapy. Whatever the refeeding process, food becomes the medication. Refeeding may comprise a variety of methods. Depending on the severity of the emaciation and the degree of resistance, the diet may take a number of forms. Least intrusive is free feeding. The patient is allowed to select her diet in consultation with her physician and staff. The patient may select whatever she wants as long as it meets nutrition criteria and her weight gain is considered medically safe by her physician. Patients tend to be highly knowledgeable about caloric content of foods. Staff must be aware of this should patients participating in meal planning select only low caloric foods or avoid specific food groups, especially carbohydrates. Another method is prescribed diet. A diet specifically formulated to match the patient's needs, it's usually prescribed by the patient's physician in consultation with a nutritionist. Prescribed diets are sometimes supplemented by enteral formulas. If the patient refuses to eat all prescribed foods, liquid supplements may be given in appropriate amounts to uneaten food portions. In other cases, nutritionally complete enteral formulas are used to maintain the refeeding process. The most intrusive refeeding methods are used when a threat to life is involved. These measures are nasogastric, or tube feeding, and total parental nutrition, or TPN. Nasogastric feeding is used with extremely ill patients who refuse to eat. The volume is determined by the physician and nutritionist and is usually administered in the privacy of the patient's room. TPN is also used in some programs as a life-saving technique for patients unresponsive to other measures. TPN involves infusing a nutritionally complete solution into a central vein. Some patients with anorexia actually prefer TPN to eating since the procedure seems less threatening. TPN, however, is a very risky procedure. Besides the potential for infection, catheter placement is often difficult in severely emaciated patients. Patients undergoing TPN should be monitored closely for accompanying complications. Whatever the refeeding process, care must be taken so that patients are not refed too rapidly. Being refed after long periods of starvation can lead to constipation, abdominal distension, edema, and most seriously, the possibility of heart failure. Patients may frequently complain of feeling bloated after meals due to their psychological discomfort with eating. The patient may equate edema with obesity, for example, despite the fact that water retention and increased weight are not permanent. All refeeding, physical activity, and behavior must be monitored closely by nursing staff. Monitoring consists of room checks, constant supervision, and special attention to any potentially manipulative behaviors. Many programs require staff to remain with patients during all feedings. Patients can be very clever in devising methods to dispose of prescribed foods and liquids. Drains, windows, toilets, and waste baskets, plants, towels, and even visitors all offer patients opportunities for disposal of prescribed foods. Even patients on nasogastric feedings may actually dismantle the tubing, discard the feeding, and reconnect the tubing afterwards. Oftentimes, patients need to be observed from 30 minutes up to an hour following feeding to ensure that vomiting does not occur. Patients may also secretly use laxatives to purge themselves. It is especially important to monitor serum electrolytes, particularly potassium, chloride, and sodium. Abnormal serum electrolytes may be the only evidence a patient is self-inducing vomiting. Patients' activity can often impede treatment. Despite their emaciated state, many patients will still attempt to exercise vigorously, either openly or in secret, to burn off added calories. Such exercise may occur in bed, on stairways, in bathrooms, or showers. If excessive exercise is impeding treatment, closely monitored exercise programs emphasizing moderation may be prescribed. Special attention must be paid to monitoring weights. Weigh-ins are a particularly difficult time for patients. They should be made routine, same time, first thing in the morning, following the morning void, and in the same clothing. Nurses must remain sensitive to the patient's feelings about gaining weight. At the same time, however, they must pay particular attention that nothing is being done to subvert the weighing process, such as loading with water prior to weigh-ins, retaining urine, or taping objects such as silverware to their bodies. 
It is important to always be aware that patients are not malevolently trying to sabotage nursing interventions. Rather, their distorted perceptions of body size and overwhelming fear of gaining weight cause them to resort to such extreme measures. The patient's self-esteem is closely intertwined with their ability to control their weight. Often the patient feels she is nothing if she is not thin. In dealing with these attitudes, nurses should avoid being judgmental and refrain from arguing about body size. Instead, the nurse should encourage patients to talk about how they feel and empathize with those feelings. The goal should be to help the patient experience an increase in self-worth in other realms besides weight. Much of this progress will take place in psychotherapy. However, the attitude of the nurse at bedside can be crucial in conveying acceptance and understanding of the patient's problem. Once the patient reaches a weight suitable for beginning other therapies, treatment to get at the underlying roots of the disorder can begin. This often consists of a combination of individual psychotherapy and family therapy. As patients approach goal weights, criteria for discharge are developed. These might include caloric intake, psychological adjustment, and potential to maintain an acceptable weight. A maintenance program can be set up prior to discharge. After discharge, continued individual and family therapy is usually recommended. After nutrition has been restored and the threat to life removed, the symptoms and dynamics which contribute to the disorder often continue. It is estimated that 25% of those with the disorder recover completely. 50% improve but continue to have nutrition-related problems. And 25% become chronic or show no improvement. One thing is certain. The personal relationship between the patient and those offering treatment can do a great deal to change the deeply ingrained distortions of body image, weight, and food which characterize the disorder. Multifaceted nursing can do much to improve patient chances for recovery. The combination of sharp clinical expertise and sensitive interpersonal skills can truly make a difference in treating these patients. Just a little bit further. Come on. 98.2 pounds. You've earned the visit. She had a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Nothing in, 120 out. Hmm. And her weight is 98.2 pounds. 98.2. That's right. And today's contingency day, so she gets to call her folks and spend the afternoon with them. Are you sure that weight's correct? 
That's what it said. Three days ago, she was 96.5. Two days ago when I left, she was 96.2. She couldn't have gained two whole pounds in that time. There's no way. Do you think she loaded herself with water before you weighed her? She registered 98.2, and that's what I recorded. But she couldn't have gained that much. I have been on for seven straight days, the last two, so that you could have some time off. I watched her every available minute I could. I try to feed her, and every bite is a debate. It's getting so that I want to throw the food at her. There's no way she could have watered herself. I checked her. The weight's 98.2, and that's what's on the chart. Look, I'm doing you a favor. You don't have to put up with her this afternoon. I know how you feel. She's a tough case. But if we're going to make this program work, we have got to be consistent. And that means staying on her every minute. It's the only way we'll get results. Right. You know this is the critical time in her repeating. She's almost at 100 pounds. That's her magic number. She hasn't weighed that for six months. If we can get her up to 100, and get her to live with it, she just may be okay. She's been here for six weeks. I know. And in all that time, she's only gained eight pounds. I know. I could do that in a weekend if I wanted to. Well, she's all yours. Uh, Kelly's with her at the moment, feeding her precious little baby. So when are you going to call your parents? Just as soon as I finish breakfast. Oh, that's it, girl. What do you think you'll do this afternoon? Shopping. <laughs> the baby movie, I don't care. Just as long as I get out of here for a while. I know. I know. There. All done. I finished it all? Oh, you didn't finish the milk. You've got to finish the milk. Well, I finished my cereal, and I ate my fruit, and I drank all my juice. I ate everything I was supposed to. You didn't finish the milk. Do you drink the milk when it's all yucky like that? Do you? No. I guess not. I made my weight. I'm eating well, and I weigh more now than I have in months. Oh, I know. You're doing great. So can I call my parents now? Sure. <laughs> These weights just don't make sense. 98.2 today, yesterday, 96 even, and two days ago, 96.2. Two pounds in two days for this kid just isn't possible. Let's see, the discharge target's 105. <sighs> This rate, it could take months. In the meantime, we're all at each other's throats. I can't blame Jackie too much. I start to feel that way myself sometimes. Kelly's got the opposite problem. She feels so sorry for her that she'll baby her to death if we're not careful. I just don't know. If I make this an issue today, there'll be hell to pay. Family therapy session didn't go well this week, so they'll be primed for trouble. Should I let it ride or not? No, I can't buy the weights. Either we're consistent and carry out the treatment by the book, or we may as well discharge her now and let her take her chances. If we don't do this right, she may never get better. Terry's coming with you? Oh, that's great. I can't wait. Kelly, I need you. Mrs. Luce fell. But I can't come now. Uh -huh. I have to stay. Right away. Come on. Uh-huh. Look, Mom, I gotta go. Yeah, or I'll never be ready at 10. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye.
Miss Kelly. Where is she? She went to help another nurse. I guess somebody fell. Mrs. Lutz fell. I had to give Wendy a hand. What's up? Sherry, I need to weigh you. What? I've already been weighed. I'm aware of that, but I need to verify your weight. Wait a minute, that's not fair. The rules say once a day at the same time. It's been taken. Going to weigh you again. Now, please. But why? I made my weight. I called my folks and they're on their way over. Besides, I just ate. Then you've got nothing to be concerned about. Come on, let's go. Ninety-five point eight. What have you got to say about that? I don't know quite what happened, but your weight this morning obviously isn't valid. You're not at 98 pounds. I don't know how you did it, but you managed to lose weight. You're staying, no pass. That's not fair. Why are you treating me like this? You can't do this to me. You hate me, that's it. Why don't you just leave me alone? Was that really necessary? The weight was invalid. Somehow she faked it. Are you sure? Here's the chart. See for yourself. Oh, we've made some progress with this kid, but if we're not consistent, it's all going to be for nothing. <laughs> what is it with you? You're making such a fuss over it. She's only 16 years old. She's a baby. She is not a baby. She is a very troubled adolescent who happens to have a very serious problem. And if we don't help her get control of this, she's not going to get better. Well, can't you ease up on her a little? That's the worst thing that you can do. If you really care about her, you'll stick to that program. I'm not asking you for any favors. I'm just saying let's all stick to procedure and back each other up. I have a hard time saying no to her sometimes. I really do. But you have to do it. This is a critical time. The closer she gets to 100 pounds, the more she's going to use every trick that she knows, and you have got to be prepared. Sherry, sure, honey, what is? You're not dressed. What is it this time? <sighs> Mommy, they said I can't go with you today. Why? What happened? You said you made your weight. Where's Sandy? This is all her fault. She hates me. Where is she, Sherry? Honey, maybe you can still get your pass. We can talk to her. I'm going to go find her. It, it's all right. Everything's going to be all right, baby. I tried to give you a call when all this happened, but you'd already left. Yeah, I understand. Isn't there some way you can train these people who work with her to do this right? Don't they know that they have to be looking for all of her tricks? They do. It's just that there are a lot of things going on here. There are other patients. And sometimes it's hard for the nurses to remember that they have to keep a close watch on her before she weighs in. Sometimes I think you're the only one who really cares about her. No, it's not that they don't care about her. It's just that it can be easier not to say no when there are so many other things that need to get done. Yeah, I can understand that. She can be very difficult to say no to. She's so determined. And I know we have to follow the procedures, but sometimes I just want to take her home, and this whole thing just isn't working. Oh, no, this is the toughest time. Uh, if we can just help her put on a few pounds, it will be safer medically to release her. And maybe then, with time, she'll learn to accept it. Well? Does she get to leave or not? No, she stays. She was so looking forward to getting out of here for a while. She said she made her weight. She faked it. We don't know how, but her weight after breakfast was less than the morning way in. How can you be so sure? Sandy said her, her urine output was low. She may have been holding back, 
She may have vomited her breakfast, I don't know. Whatever it was, the weights just weren't valid. Why can't we take her out anyway? She's close to her weight goal. What possible difference could it make? No. If we take her out now, we could compromise the whole program. We've got to do this right. Let's, let's just go in and say goodbye and go. Can I talk to you for a minute? I want to talk to Kelly. I can't talk to you. You seem pretty angry. You tricked me. Your weight this morning was incorrect. I don't know what you did, but you lost weight. I didn't do anything. Why do you keep accusing me? You're getting pretty close to 100 pounds. How does that make you feel? It scares me. I feel so fat. It's a tough time for you, isn't it? Is there anything else that's bothering you? My friend Terry was supposed to come with my parents today. My mom said she had other plans. I want to go home. Do you miss your friends a lot? It's just so boring here. It's a tough place to be if you don't want to be here. You're away from your family and your friends. It gets pretty lonely. What are you going to do for the rest of the day? What happens to the staff is that they want to just give her the food and tell her to eat. It seems like such a simple task. And the whole business about struggling and the refusal of the uh, patient with anorexia to eat is just so um, contrary to what most nurses are used to experiencing. They're used to being very helpful. Um, they're used to, you know, doing things for other people, and they go in and they try to help this, this young person eat. She refuses, and they get very angry because it feels like they're rejecting um, the nurse's help. And if they're not really um, cognizant of the psychopathology of the patient with anorexia, then, you know, they're not able to understand that it's not a willful maneuver on the patient's part to reject them, but that it's all part of the uh, disorder and the fear of gaining weight. And her weight is 98.2 pounds. 98.2. In the That's film, right. this is a good example of a behavior modification technique being employed in into an entire treatment program. Are you sure that weight's correct? Sherry uh, needed to make a certain weight, needed to make 98.2 to take her pass with her parents. Um, if she didn't make that weight, she would not have been able to take the pass. So in the case in the film, Sherry uh, fakes the weight. The night nurse should have been suspicious of that weight from the beginning. The problem here was very likely that the night nurse had many other things that she needed to attend to. And she may have been just so sick of this patient that she uh, really didn't want to deal with it. She registered 98.2, and that's what I recorded. But she couldn't have gained that much. The patients are very good at um, sort of setting up struggles and setting up power struggles that are very similar to the kinds of things that they, they do with their parents. So that in a way the staff, the nursing staff, tends to replicate what happens at home and become, react sort of like a parent would react. I checked her. The weight's 98.2 and that's what's on the chart. What happens is that the the patient with anorexia has difficulty seeing people as um, capable of being both good and bad, uh, both limit setters and nourishing, you know, parental types. And so that they tend to identify 
one staff person as the bad staff person, one staff person as the good staff person. If we're going to make this program work, we have got to be consistent. And that means staying on her every minute. But usually it happens that the person who sets the limits is the one who gets no, set up as the bad guy. Essentially, Sandy gets set up to look like the bad guy in the patient's eyes because she's the one that follows through with the limit. That's her magic number. She hasn't weighed that for six months. There. All done, see? I ate it all. Didn't finish the milk. You know you've got to finish it. Sherry would identify Kelly as the good nurse because she let her get by with something. Now, nurses can kind of per perpetuate that and accentuate that problem by being inconsistent with their limit setting. If, some, if one nurse is more lenient than another nurse, then that person will sort of buy into that patient attitude and become the good nurse. So can I call my parents now? Sure. In Kelly's case, um, she should have followed through with getting Sherry to finish her milk. Now, it seems like a silly thing to force somebody, to force a patient to finish the milk in their bowl. For most patients, it would be a silly thing, and you would never do that. But for the patient with anorexia, that's a part of the whole limit-setting consistency kind of program concept. And so that if, if you don't follow through, the patient knows that she can get by with um, a lot of tricks and uh, feels less secure because she feels like you're not really taking care of her. Look, Mom, I got to go. Yeah, I'll you know, never the patients are, are very uh -huh. slick at okay, uh, disposing Bye. of food on their trays or at, at sneaking off after the meals and vomiting up all of their food. And they're so committed to that that they'll do anything to get rid of it. They're really capable of thinking of all sorts of tricks. And I think that that's oftentimes the most frustrating thing for the, the inexperienced staff, too, because they don't, first of all, they don't always know what to watch for. And, you know, when they see it, it, it strikes them as so bizarre, which it is. Um, but they just think it's so strange that, you know, they're appalled by it. Um, and plus, the nursing staff on a medical unit is so overwhelmed with everything else. They have a number of other patients that they have to attend to, and it's not always possible for them to stay with the patient for the entire meal time or afterwards so that they're torn between wanting to follow through with the protocol, which is staying with this patient, and attending to some other more visible medical emergency. I think in Kelly's case, she had no choice. She really did have to go ahead and, and you know, help with the person that fell. And those are some of the drawbacks of you know, trying to run a program like that on a medical unit. Sherry, I need to weigh you again. Wait a minute, that's not fair. The rules say once a day at the same time. It's been taken. We're going to weigh you again. Now, please. Sandy does a very nice job of using a firm matter-of-fact approach when she um, tells Sherry that she has to reweigh her. And she doesn't come in in an angry sort of way, and she doesn't try to coerce her into going. She simply states that she doesn't have any choice and she needs to be reweighed. You're staying, no pass. That's not fair. It's important for the nurse not to become defensive around limit setting. Now, Sandy did a very good job of not becoming defensive at that point. She simply turned it around and said, no, it wasn't my responsibility that you didn't make your weight. It was your responsibility. It's not a pleasant experience to have somebody screaming at you and telling you that you're um, you know, a witch or a mean person. And especially, I think, for nurses, that's a really uncomfortable experience um, because it just doesn't go with the whole helping idea of a helping professional. What is it with you? You're making such a fuss over it. She's only 16 years old. She's a baby. She is not a baby. She well, the staff can become very Alice angry with one another about what's the right problem. thing to do and with the patient, as well as the, the staff who are very angry with the patient and are just sick of putting do. up with her. It's really important for the nurses to communicate with one another about how they're feeling and to sort of to be aware of what they're feeling early on and talk with one another about that. 
What happened? You said you made your weight. It's important for the nurse to be supportive of the parents as well because they've been struggling for months and months to get their child to eat. The biggest thing I think is the guilt. It's important for the nurse not to be judgmental toward the parents and to label them as causing their child to develop anorexia. It's important to be supportive of the parents because they have all of those feelings and to you know, help them understand the situation a little bit better. Sometimes I think you're the only one who really cares about her. Well, it's not that they don't care about her. Sandy runs the risk in be being Sherry's primary nurse, really, in this case, of being overly involved with the patient and sort of overly invested in her successful treatment. I think it's real apparent when the father says to Sandy, you're the only person that really cares about Sherry. Um, Sandy denies this, but if at some level she starts to believe that, she can kind of start perceiving herself as the savior of this patient. Now, if she feels that um, it's totally her responsibility to um, ensure that this patient walks away eating normally and never loses weight again, then she's setting herself up to feel defeated because it's, it's, not, it's very common for patients to leave the hospital and lose some weight. You're getting pretty close to 100 pounds. How does that make you feel? It scares me. I feel so fat. It's very difficult for patients with anorexia to um, express what they're feeling. Sometimes they're not even able to identify what they're feeling. Um, so the nurse can sometimes help them sort that out. Now Sandy doesn't get into arguing with her. She doesn't say, oh, you look fine, you're, you know, you're thin. Um, she just acknowledges that that's how Sherry feels. It's a tough place to be if you don't want to be here. You're away from your family and your friends. It gets pretty lonely. What are you going to do for the rest of the day? Although on the surface the patient may be battling the program, um, underneath the patient is feeling some relief that the hospital has assumed control for their eating. Um, the patient is torn by the desire to become thin versus the desire to regain control of her eating. So the message that the nursing staff has to deliver is that we won't let you starve to death, but we also won't let you become fat.